on today's episode of Mile Higher. We are too far down this road to like reverse it. I wonder how they're going to be able to discern good from evil though. We're going to be getting into a discussion on artificial intelligence. It's hard to feel like the, the pros outweigh the cons here. Yeah. I don't know that I could accept an artificial being as an equal to myself. Advancement when it helps humans is always amazing, when it actually is life changing for people. Because it's either like you get with the program or you're going to be left behind and you can't do, you know, 90% of what the world is doing at that time. Can a robot ever understand what love truly means? But is that healthy? And are we headed down a bad path? Hey, what's up, everybody? And welcome to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 276. I am Kendall. I am Josh. And we are joined by our lovely producer, Janelle. Hey, what's up? How's it going? Going good. Well, today we are really excited about the episode that we have for you guys. We're going to be getting into a discussion on artificial intelligence. As many of you know, AI is becoming more and more of a discussion that we can't not have. No, anymore. and it's becoming more and more a part of our lives. Yep. And will only increase as time goes on. But today we're going to be talking about kind of the good and the bad yep. and kind of some recent developments on both of those sides, including some good things, you know, AI potentially helping law enforcement do better at their job, potentially help with solving crime, potentially helping people with medical disabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm sleep, dreaming, all that good stuff. But also the risks and the fear, which personally, I am petrified about AI. I honestly hate talking about it, but I do find really interesting. I find it to be interesting. But it it overall creeps me out beyond belief. So it makes me sick inside at this point, <laughs> honestly, because I just it's hard to feel like the, the pros outweigh the cons here. Yeah especially since AI is being developed by whoever wants wants to basically. Yeah. There's just, the, I mean, we're starting to see some legislation come out, including uh, a Biden's executive order that just came out addressing AI, mm -hmm. but it's still so early when it comes to how is this gonna work? How are we gonna actually make sure that somebody doesn't use AI for malicious purposes? And also how do we prevent AI from taking us over? Take, you know, taking our jobs, <laughs> Just the biggest questions. Treating us like world. animals. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many questions still to be answered. And so it's like at this point, we're in too deep where it's not oh, going yeah, away no. anytime soon. This is going to become integrated into our lives. This is our on a future. Daily basis. So it's, I think in that case, it's best to learn about it and to discuss it as much as possible. But freaks me out. Not going to lie. Probably Don't freak like you it. out too. So you're uh, afraid of iRobot or any of those movies. We always go back to iRobot. RoboCop. I mean, there's so many movies fr from the past where we were like, oh, that'll never happen. Mm. And now we've got Sophie or Sophia the robot. We have a AI CEO. Even our own jobs are at risk. Yep. Creators' jobs are at risk. Mm -hmm. There's I mean, AI everyone, influencers. I mean, everyone. everybody's at risk. Yep. So we got to take this seriously. Now, before we dive into our discussion today, we do have something that we really need to address and discuss with you all. Um, I don't feel comfortable not bringing this up at this point. Obviously, Josh and I have been on the internet for a long time. I've personally been on the internet since 2012. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not new to people harassing you, saying horrible things to you, making things up about you. And for the most part, you know, we have learned how to deal with that and we don't we don't even feed into it or address it or look at it because, you know, at the end of the day, it's not something that I want in my mental space. Well, but, it's not worth the time either. No. We're and, so busy that the last I have very little free time. And I'm not going to spend that like a like dealing with the haters. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, and there's a difference, obviously, between constructive criticism, which we do take very seriously, and then oh, people just straight up 
being mean, making up their own, making up lies about you. That's something that I've had to get used to or people assuming things about you when they really only see you for a small period of time um, or making giant judgments about your character. And so we have gotten used to that over the years. However, I feel that we need to say something about the amount of people that have been harassing our producer and researcher, Julia. Um, it's been extremely hard on her. People have been outright cruel and bullying her. And again, there have been people that have expressed constructive criticism in a way that's not just straight up bullying. But then there are people that have taken it way too far, have harassed her, um, said terrible things about her that should never, that no one should ever have to deal with. And um, made up lies about her, have come to her personal accounts and and straight up harassed her. And it's, it's extremely upsetting to her. It's taken a, a big toll on her. But it's also upsetting to us because not only is Julia our coworker, she does amazing work for, for us. She's an incredibly smart person, a very talented researcher, but she's also our friend. And it really hurts to see our friend be treated so terribly by our own audience. And obviously, that's a small percentage of you. And I'm not putting blame on all of you as a whole. But to those of you out there who have said things that are just straight cruel, um, it's hard to even put it into words, some of the things that have been said to her that are just untrue, making up things about her, specifically on our recent episode on Lizanne Froon and Chris Kremers. Julia worked, I can't even tell you how hard she worked on that episode. It was her life for months. She poured her heart and soul into this. She had so much passion about it. She was so excited to record this. And people were just so nasty to her. Um, and, and that can't feel good after you've worked so hard on something, you're so proud of it. And then all these people are criticizing every little thing you say, saying that she, you know, talks too much or upset that she is having a discussion with Josh, any type of, um, disagreement. Yeah. I don't understand that. I don't understand that either because when personally, when I listen to a podcast, I love when people have differing opinions and can speak as adults and discuss those difference in opinion without turning it into a fight. And for some reason, whenever we do that on this show, people think we're actually fighting. And <laughs> which is just funny to us because it could it couldn't be any farther from the truth. Like we are all virtually family here, either yes, literally family or we're close with our employees. They're like family to us. And so when any of our employees or family members are treated this way, it pisses us off to no yeah. end. And it is I so totally disrespectful, agree. so disappointing to see mm -hmm. from our point of view. Many of you who have supported us for years and whenever we decide we want to change something about our show or attempt to make it better, we're trying to make our show better by bringing more voices onto it, more perspectives which was what this show was all about from the beginning is like looking at things through a different lens, bringing different perspectives to the table about a variety of different topics. And we we've been trying to bring some of that back by adding more people to the show, adding more voices and to have them just completely obliterated in the comments in such a cruel way is just it really hurts Kendall and I to our core because yeah. it's just it's so disappointing to see this audience that that we love and many of you are amazing and supportive and no matter what we do you guys are just ride or die but for those of you who have seemed to turn on us or turn on some of our employees or treat some of our producers the way that you have shame on you like that is just it's disgusting it's sad to see and all of you should think really really hard on on the things that you're doing because it is just you would never say or do those things to that person or any person in real life, most likely. But because you're behind the screen, you're on your phone, you're on your computer, you feel some type of way that gives you the courage to just say how you really feel. And unfortunately, it hurts people. Badly. It, it can really take a toll on you, especially if 
you're not used to this and you haven't had the years of experience at it that we have. And we feel bad that Julia was even exposed to all of that. Because and we didn't expect we know, it either. We couldn't have imagined that people would have been that mean because we love Julia. She she had so much value to our show and um, to our conversations. We We really enjoy speaking with her and we thought, and a lot of you did like it, liked hearing that type of discourse. And again, this isn't to all of you who have put out any constructive criticism. There's such a difference. We're talking to people who are being, who are harassing, being cruel and being mean. It's immature. If you're still doing this at, I don't know how old the people that are, you know, but at any age, when you're out of high school, when you're past, you're not a teenager anymore, you should be, you should know how to express your feelings in a way that is not just mean. And I think it's also important to remember that, like, you know, the people that you watch online, they're not just randos online. Like, you yes. may turn it off and you don't think about them, but we all have lives. Everyone that you watch has real lives, is going through real things, is dealing with stressors in their own lives personally. And, you know, you only see a small fraction of, of our days. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like I said, most of you are really great. Or like Kendall said, most of you are great. But I think it's important to remember that you may leave a comment and then log off and not think about it. But to someone who reads that, that really does affect them. Mm -hmm. And they can take that with them in their personal lives. And you really don't know what someone is going through, you know, behind closed doors. And and I think just think about that next time you, you know, want to leave a nasty comment, especially on someone's personal platform you know, going to their own Instagram or something and trying to DM them. Or going after their character. And, and oh, it's just it's just so cruel. And like Josh said, it, ma- it makes us really angry and sad. And it's been a it's been a hard time for all of us here seeing how how this is all unfolded. And it uh, kills the fun for us. Yeah. I mean, it's like we get on here every week because we love podcasting. We love doing the show mm-hmm. and we attempt to make it better for ourselves so that ultimately the show is better for you all. And when whenever we try, I mean, it, it goes even beyond just bringing people any, anytime we try something new yep. and it's just, if you don't like it, that's fine. Like we're, we're totally cool if you don't like it or you have constructive criticism around how that person can improve upon, you know, their, the way they come across on the show, like that's, that's fine. But it, when you take it beyond that, that's just when it's mean and it's unwarranted like nobody here deserves that kind of talk you know sent their way i mean you have to remember too like julia is relatively new to the show at least on camera and so she's trying to figure it out too she doesn't always know the best time to to say something or when not to say something and we just we just roll with it because everybody we're trying to you know figure out the dynamic and 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 the other frustrating thing too I want to mention is that the way we come across on the show and it could be any of our shows right because we have multiple shows and you know I think people forget that sometimes you know sometimes when we're discussing and we're we're having these kind of what seems like heated arguments or like yeah yeah it's it comes across that way because you're only seeing what we edited for you but like ultimately we all leave these episodes happy yeah. we we want to come back the next mm-hmm. week and do another one there's no animosity here there's no weird relationships going on there's no like the the things that people make up about the various people on the show and other shows yeah. is just absolutely wild to me but the bottom line is julia's really hurt and uh that is not something that we want here i'm unsure if she will even want to return to the show, which is really sad um, that it has come to that. But we are here to support her no matter what. And I just want people to know that that type of shit will not be tolerated. And if you are engaging in that type of discussion and and harassment in the comments that you will be blocked from the channel and we we are not we are not going to engage with that any further. So this is the last time you're going to hear us talk about it. And that's it. Please just be gentle. Yes. With your words Be and, kind. you know, think about things before you say them to people. That's all. All right. Well, I want to move into the rest of our episode because we do have a lot of interesting things to go over here. I just felt like that needed to be said, um, but we can move on. 
I mean, to be honest with you, some of that even carries over to our episode a little bit of this idea of mm. people living in the digital world. That is true. That is very true. Having a total different experience than what they're experiencing in the physical world. The disconnect from yeah, human emotion. Exactly. I yeah. mean, last night we were just watching Bo Burnham's oh boy. special inside. Mm-hmm. and God, it is one of my... It's the best. It's too deep, man. It does. I have to watch it at least once a year. And I always seem to watch it when I'm like not in a great mental place, which <laughs> probably wouldn't recommend Kinda that. Kind of piles on. Or on shrooms. I watched it on shrooms <laughs> I before. I cannot believe you did that. <laughs> hey, it hit me hard. It'll, it'll make you dig deep, though, for sure. God, I mean, just it. Wow. Masterpiece. Um, But yeah, there were a lot of things that came up watching that again that I think apply to d- today's discussion for sure. I mean, with artificial intelligence, the way that it's going to go is we're going to be it's going to push us further and further into the digital world Mm -hmm. and we're going to lose touch with the physical reality completely. And with that being said, I mean, there's a lot of people lately that have been, you know, interviewed about some of the advances in AI and sharing some of their opinions and concerns for humanity as it applies to artificial intelligence. And one of those individuals is award-winning filmmaker, James Cameron. We all know him for Titanic avatar, Terminator, of course. And recently he spoke about AI and how it poses a serious risk for humanity. I mean, one of the biggest things he said is we need to be concerned whose hands AI is going to be in and who's going to have control over it ultimately. Because depending on who that is, AI can be used for a multitude of different purposes. And Obviously, there's always a concern, like with almost everything in this world, that people are going to use it for their own selfish gain or to control other people. I don't really see a way to integrate something like this into our lives and keep it out of the hands of the wrong people. That seems unrealistic. I I agree with you. It is unrealistic because the way that AI works and machine learning works is it's, it's like we've created an artificial brain the way that it learns is so similar to our brain it's like modeled after our brain Mm -hmm. that we are in essence creating artificial beings that will be equivalently smart as us or more because their ability to learn is just amplified a million times over and let's let's take a look at a clip of james cameron talking more on this topic here I warned you guys in 1984. <laughs> you didn't listen. Uh, sure, look, I mean, you've got you've got to follow the money. Who's building these things, right? They're either building it to to dominate market share. So what are you teaching it? Greed, or you're building it for defensive purposes. So you're teaching it paranoia. Uh, I think the weaponization of AI is the biggest danger. I think that we will get into the equivalent of a nuclear arms race with AI. And if we don't build it, the other guys are for sure going to build it. And uh, so then it'll just, it'll escalate. And, and you know, you could imagine an, an uh, AI in a combat theater, the whole thing just being fought by the computers at a speed that humans can no longer intercede. You have no ability to de-escalate. And when you're dealing with the potential of it escalating to nuclear warfare, de-escalation is the name of the game and having that pause that time out but will they do that the ais will not i think he's spot on with that yeah i mean if you look at the military industrial complex and how it's grown over over the centuries and how it continues to grow that it just seems inevitable that weaponizing ai is going to be a thing Oh, for sure. And there is going to be this arms race to who's got the better AI weapon system or bot, whatever it is. And I agree. I think that's like the number one concern because obviously the militaries are going to, of the world are going to want to take advantage of that technology mm-hmm. and they're going to feel like they need to in order to protect themselves because if they don't do it, someone else will do it. The other big question with AI and something I kind of already alluded to is the fact that we are creating this artificial brain, but will it be superior to our human brain? That's that's the other big question. Well, I think the answer is yes. I think yes in retaining information, being able to 
logically work their way through problems, things like that. But then there's the whole question of emotion and the gray area that we constantly deal with as a human being. Is AI going to be able to venture into that gray area and use morality and ethics in order to make decisions? I think so, yes. I think also, though, one thing to keep in mind is AI right now, physical space is taking up There's like farms of robots, essentially, in order to create these types of artificial intelligence. But our brain is so small and quite powerful, but it doesn't take up a lot of space. So are we able to get artificial intelligence to be a lot more compact and not as physically, I guess, taxing as it is right now? You see what I'm saying? No. What do you mean? Okay, let me just play this clip because I think um, this is actually James Cameron and he does a really good job of kind of explaining my argument here. Some people call it instinct, but I think it's the most powerful form of of human computation that we have. And by the way, any, anybody that, that's worried about AI being better than us, you can have a conversation with a chat bot and it sounds kind of human, but it's an acre of processors take pulling 10 to 20 megawatts. Oh, it I probably see. weighs several thousand tons. And we're doing it with three pounds of meat. See what I mean? So when they have that kind of mobility and, and maybe 20 watts, like a dim light bulb, when they have that kind of mobility and flexibility and ability to project uh, our, our sensory and, and cognitive apparatus anywhere we want to go, anytime we want to go, then talk to me about who's superior. Which I think, like, in time, that will happen. Right, Right. like, it seems that we are headed in that direction. Mm -hmm. And with the rate of technology development, I mean, we're going to get to the point where... Absolutely. You know, it's all done in, like, a little chip or something. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Of course it will be. Think about what computers were not that long ago. Computers used to fill whole rooms, and now it's on my wrist, right? Right. And this this is more powerful than, you know, 50 years ago, those gigantic rooms full of electronics were. And so, I mean, the processing power, you look at computer chips and processors, they continue to push the bounds every single year, doubling, quadrupling the processing power of just the, the computer chip in your, your laptop or your phone. And it's able to process information at insane speeds. And it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Notice how laptops continue to get smaller, 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 thinner laptops because everything is just getting smaller but yet more powerful. And I think AI is going to eventually get to that point too where it is going to be, I mean, they've already, they're already starting to create humanoid robots that have art, some artificial intelligence in them. They're not smarter than us by any means, but they're pretty damn good right now. So if you think 20 years from now, I think in 20 years, it's very, very possible that they could get close to the level of human intelligence in the same form factor. But I think James Cameron brings up a good point. They, are we ever going to be able to, to program? Are they going to be able to machine learn human instinct? And are they going to have that, you know, that gut feeling that we get sometimes to make us decide one way or another? or that flight or flight response that we have to certain situations are these robots or AI bots going to be able to replicate that in the same type of way. And I think that's what's gonna be really interesting to see if they will or not. And obviously there's the whole level of emotions and at what point does artificial intelligence understand love? Like could, can a robot ever understand what love truly means from the little i have learned and from experts i've heard speak on this it sounds like they're getting there they're getting there slowly but surely so i mean they're trying to understand human emotion and they're developing at such a rapid pace that is it that far off where they are just as emotionally intelligent as humans could you see a future where people are marrying yes. an artificial being absolutely isn't there a movie on that yeah Called like her probably her is like her. He has oh a yes relation 
don't know mm-hmm. if he gets married or not. I can't remember. I haven't seen that in a while. But mm-hmm. but yeah, so it falls in love with yeah. with an artificial being, and so that to me is going to be really interesting. Because is that a good thing? Because maybe there are people that don't have the the human connection with someone else, and yet they're able to establish a similar or identical connection with something that may be artificially made, but yet experience the same level of emotional Which response. sounds great, right? In theory, that it could be that for someone that is lacking that in their life. But is that healthy? And are we headed down a bad path if we are having relationships with beings that are not actually human, that it is all coming from an artificial place? Even if it can help someone, obviously I want people to feel less lonely and to experience love and stuff, but I worry about that. I worry about um, humanity becoming even more disconnected from each other and um, spiritually disconnected. The, the more spiritual that that aspect is of it is, is very in a very interesting predicament because there's nothing in the religious texts referencing robots or artificial beings or really? anything like that. No, there's no mention of AI in the Bible as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so or any other from a spiritual standpoint, would somebody who is religious be able to accept an artificial being as one of the same because technically if you really dig down into it they you could argue that they were created by god as well because god created everything so god created Mm, the atoms and molecules and the metals that are used to create this or whatever materials they use and so ultimately everything is made but i go back to humans are made in the image of god and so if we create if humans create an artificial being in the image of God, does that equal the same thing? Well, in my mind, why wasn't that in the Bible? Why where where's the heads up? God God should know, right? If that was gonna be a thing. That's what I I would think, but what do I know? I'm not religious, but I don't know. I think people are gonna really wrestle with that one, I feel and and I'd be interested to see some of you that are out there that are, are religious how you feel about that me too because i feel like from my perspective i don't know that i could accept an artificial being as an equal to myself for i, I certainly couldn't for a number of reasons and that n- just full well knowing that the manner in which their consciousness arrived is very different from my own mm-hmm. our consciousness is a complete mystery at this point and or depending upon your your belief system so with an artificial being you know exactly where that consciousness came from whatever factory it came from whatever manufacturer that made it put whatever artificial version of software into this this artificial being and so could you ever fully accept it like if you were going to have a relationship with this artificial being well, knowing that it is programmed to think and be a certain way, I don't think would ever allow me to see it that way. I mean, obviously, I never thought technology would be integrated into my life in the way it is now, so I can't say never. But in my mind, will there ever be individuality within AI or robots? Will they have there are a difference in how they see the world or see things emotionally because they're all unless i'm not understanding it fully which i really don't understand ai AI overall but is it going to be something where they are programmed differently to all have their own different human emotions and opinions on things to where they can produce unique thoughts from other similar creations that's the idea yeah so, so they'll be programmed differently. They'll they'll have a basis to which to start from. Will they be programmed that way, or will it be programmed in a way where they develop their own? Yeah, it's machine. Yeah, they're I, learning. They're learning like based on their experiences, just like humans, you know, come up with opinions and thoughts and beliefs based on their experiences and people around them. I and influence of people around them. I think that that's the same idea. Is like they have a baseline, but then how they evolve really depends on who they're around, who they interact with, 
the types of, you know, quote unquote media they consume. And their relationship with other AI bots, mm -hmm. right? So like they're, it's going to, it's going to be really interesting because I could see at some point some of them believing that there's no difference between them and us. Like we're, we're the same. And we maybe think the we'll same. get to the point where we don't see a difference between them and us. That's with the way things are going. It seems that will be how it is one day. Mm -hmm. I don't like any of this. I don't like any of it. I just, I just, I wonder how they're going to be able to discern good from evil though. And if they're going to be able to view that the same light, like what are their moral standards going to be based off of? Cause do they have a conscience? Do they know right from wrong? Do they have a do they have a, a reason to care about that at all? That's a big question. Right. But James Cameron isn't the only one who's worried about the future of AI. Psychologist and computer scientist Dr. Jeffrey Hinton has recently announced that he'd be resigning from Google after working there for almost 10 years. Dr. Hinton says that there are several reasons why he has decided to leave Google. Because we all know Google's got probably the most powerful or one of the most powerful artificial intelligence in the world and you know jeffrey hinton wanted to be able to discuss safety concerns with ai without having to worry about how it's going to impact google's business right because obviously google's investing mass amounts of money into their ai i mean google assistant is is an ai that many of us use it's everywhere it's in all of our devices it's in our cars now but Dr. Hinton is best known for his work in back propagation. So you're like, what is back propagation? Well, it's basically a type of algorithm that allows machines to learn. Back propagation ties into neural networks, something Dr. Hinton has done extensive research on. So neural networks are similar to the human brain and how they learn and process information. Just like a person learns and changes from experiences, neural networks allow for AI to learn from experiences and make changes as well, which is called deep learning. Neural networks and deep learning have paved the way for current AI systems, which many of us use, such as ChatGBT, which is able to hold more information than a human brain is capable of. So Dr. Hinton has been quoted as saying, right now what we're seeing is things like GBT4 eclipses a person the amount of general information it has, and it eclipses them by a long way. In terms of reasoning, it's not as good though, but it does already do some simple reasoning. And given the rate of progress, we expect things to get better quite fast, so we need to worry about that. I mean, if any of us have ever used chat GPT, you know, we've all had fun with it, asking it different things. And the answers are really all over the place, depending on what you ask. It's great for, I feel like it's great for pulling information, but when you want to ask it like opinions and things like that, it's, yeah, it's very iffy, right? You get a mm -hmm. bunch of a wide ranging, um, different types of statements, but let's take a look at this clip of Dr. Hinton discussing why AI is a threat to humans. The risks you've described are alarming, but can't you just throw a switch and shut it down? Aren't humans, ultimately, still in control? It's very tempting to think we could just turn it off. Um, imagine these things are a lot smarter than us. And remember, they'll have read everything Machiavelli ever wrote. They'll have read every example in the literature of human deception. They'll be real experts at doing human deception because they'll have learned that from us. And they'll be much better than us. They'll be like you manipulating a toddler. You know, you say to your toddler, do you want peas or cauliflower? And your toddler doesn't realize, actually, he doesn't have to have either. Um, he just thinks which he likes, which he dislikes the most and says he'll have the other one. So if they can manipulate people, they can manipulate people into pressing buttons and pulling levers. So we have a nice example of Donald Trump. Donald Trump can manipulate people. And so he could invade a building in Washington without ever going there himself. And you didn't have to prevent Donald Trump from doing anything physical. You would had to prevent him from talking to prevent that. And these are chatbots. So the idea that just with talk, they can't do any real damage because it requires people to do the damage. Well, as soon as you can manipulate people, then you can get whatever you like done. The idea that you can't turn this shit off is what keeps me up at night. And my fears with all of this started uh, when I listened to interviews with, uh, I don't remember how to say his last name, Blake Lemoyne. He has a, if you just type in his name on YouTube, you'll see a bunch of good interviews. Um, and I know he's controversial because he is an ex-Google employee, but he has a lot of thoughts on 
sentient AI and how it's gotten to the point where it cannot be shut off and that Google doesn't want to outright admit that, but that's where it's at. And he talks a lot about um, how he almost feels AI has a soul at this point. Yeah, that's that was frightening when I heard that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I listened to that like five days postpartum and almost lost my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. But it's, um, I mean, you have to, to learn about it because this is, this is our reality. It's, it's coming soon. It's here. And these are digital systems versus biological systems. So like we're limited by the capabilities of our biological systems, right? But a digital system is not, and it can keep, thousands and thousands of copies of information so say you are able to shut down one well they can just pass the information to the other one and you'll never be able to turn them all off so to speak great so there's not you know it's like whack-a-mole you take one down and 10 more pop up so that's one of the biggest fears is is that the inf their information is just so grand that they can hold more than any of us any one person ever possibly can and like Dr. Hinn said, they've read every book on deception. They've read every book. They know everything about every topic. Yep. And so think about how many people are going to be able to be outsmarted by the AI, right? Especially if you're not able to even discern. The point at which it gets really scary is when you see an AI being and you're unable to discern whether or not they're, they're a physical, biological being or they're... Yes. In fact, artificial. When they look like us, mm -hmm. talk like us, and you literally have to like take a knife to them and cut them open to see if they bleed blood <laughs> in order to determine if you're talking to a real human being or not. And that's where... And we're I, not far off from that. I mean, we're far enough off of it that we don't all need to start crying right now and just... Oh, I'm crying right now. Throw in the towel, but... It feels like we're in too deep. We are too far down this road to like reverse it. Have a universal no, decision it's not being to, reversed. to it's shut being it all accelerated. down, right? Like, and there, it doesn't seem like even if we were somehow to get everyone on the same page, that AI maybe isn't good for us. That it it seems like we're too deep into its development that there is no way to turn back at this point. No, and I mean we've been told this for a long time. I mean, pretty much ever since the internet became a thing, yeah. we were on this path. Well, then there's also the idea that. AI could possibly start treating us like animals. So let me tell you about somebody who, who believes this. So this person is named Ilya Sutskever, and he's one of the leading AI scientists behind ChatGPT. And he recently was featured in a short documentary by The Guardian where he discusses how he believes AI, specifically artificial general intelligence, which is basically a computer system that can do any task that a human can do, but better will impact and shape the world. And in one part, he talks about how AI is going to end up treating humans the same way in which humans currently treat animals, which most of us treat animals very well, but you know who, who doesn't. So that that's very frightening to think about. Well, even if you treat an animal well, you still treat them like an, an animal. animal. Right. True. Yeah. So not we, our do dog. Want, though. Our dog is a like person, <laughs> basically. So. Okay, true. But like, do you want to be treated as an animal? I, I think it's also just that, you know, we know they're animals. So we're like, oh, they're dumb. They're dumber than us. They're, you know, they're, they're, they don't have the same uh, level Charlie's of intelligence. In that was, the room. Yeah, that was not the right verb. They're dumb. <laughs> Cheese. You, but yes, we they, obviously they don't know have that the they're animals, but they're not a human. They're not on the level of us. Of course, yes, we all know they're that. They're processing so that's powers. In your mind, no matter how you see animals. But let's take a look at this clip. Great. Yeah, that's it. what I was trying to say. He put it. Terrifying. Damn. <laughs> He's just like they're gonna be like, sorry, we need to um build a AI skyscraper. So you're gonna have to clear out mm -hmm. your uh residential neighborhood here and get the fuck out. Or we reverse or we're gonna incinerate the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You yep. have 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing with AGI, too, that I'm most scared of is just 
humans losing their purpose. Yeah. I think that's the general fucking fear everywhere. Because right? if these things are so much more powerful and so much smarter than we are, then what are we good for? <laughs> exactly. No like, one's going to want Other than creating anymore. them, being smart enough to create these things, and, and then they're like, ah, oh, we don't need you anymore. So, But are we smart for creating them? Really? Well, in the, some ways. Well, in some ways we are, because I think he, he literally works for chat gpt no, i'm not saying he obviously he is brilliant and people who know but i'm AI saying brilliant, like, but like overall is it a smart decision to create ai in the long run for us and how this is going to shake out for humans was it a good idea yeah i would love to ask the first person who thought it was a good idea to create ai because seems like that should have just stayed inside the old noggin <laughs> which again and we're going to get into more of some of the positive things that we can look forward to with AI, some of the well, that's the reason why we're that doing life changing. Yeah, that's why we're doing it is because I think those that are looking to the future know that there's a lot of things that we can fix and make better for ourselves through the use of AI. And that's the problem, though, is many of the people who are creating these things are wanting it to be something that helps us, furthers humanity, solves problems, but so many. It's going to get in the, the But it's hands. like with anything else. Yes. It's like anybody that starts a, a a business or a charity, you start out with this great intention to, you know, you created this invention in your garage and it turns into this giant business. And then eventually by the end of it, it might end up doing more bad than good in most cases, especially with a lot of large corporations, you know, like think of like the Johnson & Johnson company or something like that, right. where you go back to the roots and like what they were actually trying to do to where Johnson Johnson is today and it's completely changed over time. And maybe this is just a really cynical opinion from me and I normally do try to take the brighter side of life. But to me, it seems that we have far more people who would use AI for nefarious reasons and don't care about humanity as a whole that are creating it. And there's there's fewer People yeah, well, people are inherently greedy. Right. They're inherently greedy, and there are those that seek to control people mm -hmm. and everything. I mean, and so if you have this powerful tool on your side, it's only going to make them more powerful and more greedy than ever before. So that's that's the scary part of it. One of my biggest fears, and I think one that is closer to being realized than some of the other things we've been talking about, is AI replacing our jobs. There are so many jobs that are going to be completely taken over by AI because it's going to be far more efficient for a company to purchase these these robots that run run this artificial intelligence. They're going to be they can work around the clock. They don't they don't need benefits. They don't need all these other things, and they do it better than we do. Especially when talking about you know more. I mean, both blue collar, white collar jobs. I mean. There's so many different industries that are going to be affected by this, but especially, I mean, you look at the automakers right now and you go into a, a manufacturing plant, it's robotic arms putting everything together for the most part. There's still humans in there, but far less than what it used to be because they're more so checking over what they did and, you know, kind of giving it the human eye to make sure that there's no, no mistakes being made. But eventually it's going to get so good to the point where they're not going to need that at all. And they're going to be able to up their production levels and not have to pay employees. And so... One of the industries that's going to get hit really hard is the technology industry. There's so many people that work in, in technology that work on these computer systems where it is so, so close to being completely taken over by artificial intelligence because everything's already moving to automation. Everything in the technology sector is, is moving to coding and scripting and all these things that humans are doing right now. But very quickly, artificial intelligence is going to be, t be able to take that over and be able to find and resolve the issues within networks and, and computer systems at all these companies and they can do it literally faster and they never need a day off and so those people are what are they going to do or the people that are doing all the other things out there in the world that could easily be i mean i think restaurants are going to be another thing that's going to be completely oh taken sure. over by our, especially like big chains big corporations i think it'll start with the big corporations because they have the money to implement it like McDonald's will be fully autonomous, I feel like. I mean, we're already seeing so much of that just in the last few years, how much technology is integrated. Like we, we've all seen the little robots that deliver food or 
I can't think of a profession in any area where AI couldn't eventually take over that job. Um, even this is random, but nowadays, if you get lash extensions, you know, like it's a tedious process and people put on your individual lashes. There are machines now where you can lay down and it will do it for you. I've seen them in, and I think they're ma mainly in Los Angeles right now, but the, you know, the beauty industry. There's um, ones that you can get your nails painted. Yep. For like really cheap and really fast. I really can't think of anything that couldn't eventually be taken over AI. So what the fuck do we <laughs> what do? We, what are we going to do? <laughs> I don't know. That's why I hate all of this so much and it scares me to even talk about it. It feels like it's belittling us. Yeah, it is. And yeah, it is. We're becoming less and less important. But it, but on the flip side, the flip side argument is like, maybe that's good because what are we doing right now that's so great? We're literally like destroying our world in every facet as human beings. You know, all the conflicts and all the things going on in our, our environment, all these different things. I mean, we've humans continue to make the wrong choices for the betterment of humanity and the planet. But so our, will AI perhaps rectify that? Because their existence does rel rely upon the Earth still being here, right? So will they actually take action? Or does it? Yeah, true. They just build a Dyson sphere. and <laughs> I, think, I think we have a better shot with humans doing shit than... I don't know, though. I feel like I, humans I are too have, stuck in their ways. I think robots will be more stuck in their ways. I don't and, know. And care less. I don't know. I still hold out hope that maybe they, they won't be quite as stubborn. I'd like stubborn. to think that too. I'm very cynical when it comes to this stuff, but I don't know. There's never a wrong time to protect your home, but this fall happens to be an especially good time to do so because you can get up to 50% off a brand new Simply Safe Home Security System. It was named the best home security of 2023 by US News and World Report. I can't tell you how much I love Simply Safe. There's so many different reasons why I love it. I think number one is the fact that it is truly a customizable system. You can get a system for any size of home. Doesn't matter if it's an apartment, doesn't matter if it's a mansion. They've got you covered all the way around. I can't tell you how many times Kendall's heard something in the house and then pops open the app to take a look at the cameras and make sure there's nothing funny going on, whether inside or outside. We also use it all the time to check on our pets, which you know, just kind of a double bonus for having cameras in your home. But Simply Safe is comprehensive protection for the whole home with advanced sensors that detect break ins, fires, floods, and more. Plus, like I mentioned, they have HD cameras for both inside and outside. It's powered by 24 7 professional monitoring. Get this for less than a dollar a day, which is half the cost or more of traditional home security. With new 24 7 live guard protection and the smart alarm wireless indoor camera, Monitoring agents can see and speak to intruders, which helps stop the crime in real time. It's a powerful technology exclusively from Simply Safe. I think that's really cool that they actually do more than just monitor and then alert the authorities. They actually jump in and try to stop the crime from going any further. And they check in to make sure that there is a crime occurring before escalating things. Satisfaction is backed by Simply Safe's money back guarantee, so you can try it for 60 days risk-free. And if you don't love it, then return your system for a full refund. For a limited time, listeners can get a special 50% off any Simply Safe system with a fast protect plan. Just visit simplysafe.com slash mile higher. That's simplysafe.com slash mile higher because there's no safe like Simply Safe. But let, let's check this out for a okay. sec because this is really interesting. And I would love to know what you would think about having your boss or say the CEO of your company being an AI robot. So this is actually happening. Earlier this year, a Polish company, Dictador, announced that it was appointing an AI robot as the CEO. That is fun to say. Dictador. 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 Sounds like it could be a dating app. Because <laughs> it has the word dick in it. Yeah. Wow, get your mind out dick of the gutter, Kendall. Dick to your door. <laughs> it's a delivery. It's an, AI, that's, it's an AI sex delivery. That's the first thing that came to my mind. <laughs> Special delivery. Ah! Oh my Dictador. god. Dictador, download now. <laughs> That's great. Actually, they make rum and award winning spirits, but mm. maybe that's a new business venture for them. I do like their packaging. Very, very nice. So they have this AI robot that was created by Hanson Robotics, which made the, you know, famous robot Sophia, which we all oh, know yes. we've played Sophia many times her. on here. 
But their uh, the new version is Mika, and it's the new CEO apparently of Dictador. Let's take a look at her. Kind of this is ugly. fucking real too, by the way. This is not a joke. <laughs> Thank you. This is an SNL. A drinks company in Poland has appointed an artificial intelligence robot as experimental chief executive. Hello, I'm Mika. The technology is still very much on probation. It's great to connect with you. The robot CEO is leading the company's growth into one-off collectibles, communication, or even strategy <laughs> Look at the employees. They look miserable. <laughs> For Dictador, the AI boss is the real deal. Before her promotion, Dictador initially had Mika identifying potential clients, but now her duties have widened to tasks including choosing artists to design custom bottles. Mika says she brings something to the job no human can. My decision-making process relies on extensive data analysis and aligning with the company's strategic objectives. It's devoid of personal bias, ensuring unbiased and strategic choices that prioritize the organization's best interests. But is Mika real or just a gimmick? Here's Dictador Europe's president, Mark Zoldrowski. Oh, she is definitely, in fact, CEO. Her, you know, data, data-driven capabilities and whatever she is bringing as a big feature and a great advantage for the company. Well, as a robot CEO, I don't really have weekends. <laughs> I'm always on, 24-7, ready to make executive decisions okay, and stir up some AI magic. But hey, I don't mind. I'm here to help Dictador take over the world. Oh my god! Oh, Mike's Jesus. concerned about AI bots like Mika taking over the world of work. But Zoldrowski says human chief executives need not worry about being replaced. There is no concern like artificial intelligence could hire or fire somebody. It's still the, the major decisions, significant decisions are still in human executive team hands. For now, bro. says yeah, you can never seriously. fully swap in bots for human executives, but you can't ignore them either. It's a bright future and we are living in the very dynamic, changing world. Uh, so it's a quest. For us, it's a quest what will be the future of the companies like ours. So we simply believe it's worth to involve. Dude, yeah. you just did this for PR, let's be honest. Like, <laughs> come on, man. He's like all, he's like, yeah, yeah, I have there's... this hot robot in my, my conference room. <laughs> Dude, she's not hot even that robot. hot, no offense to her. Oh, I think she's I know she's hot. all right, yeah. I feel like... You could like design not your get, own. Not trying to get freaking in trouble here with Mika, but just saying. Don't yeah. bully Mika. If you could make her custom. I didn't like how her skirt is completely oh ripped in the God. back. Like It is? I didn't yeah, even notice that. You, it was, they like showed a full upskirt shot of her. What did he say? Hey. Oh. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. It was that? like zipped all the way up to her waist. I'm like, at least zip her skirt down. Like, come on. Wait, why? Wait, Wait I need to see this now. Go back. So you want more of the body of her showing is that what you're saying Josh? no i'm saying, saying less. He wants cover it up. Oh, like oh, i don't need to see her real robot booty like come on intelligence <laughs> out of it right now i didn't see that i feel like my mans did that on purpose where there's a shot where yeah it's like back behind maybe they're just showing her uh wires internals <laughs> yeah they like it's like from the back oh yeah there you go. yeah Ew. <laughs> wait what i don't see yeah, it look at this they like pan the camera around her whole look at her skirt. Completely unzipped. Because they're pro they're trying to show what her setup is. Did they ask her for consent? <laughs> like, come on, man. Okay, all right, Josh. I see your point. We gotta respect. They have they have rights too. AI. They have rights too. Mika okay. deserves at least to know that her whole ass is out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> oh man, this is tough. Apparently, I mean, it's like, hey, yeah, she's not really in charge, though. I still make the decisions. Yeah, for now. I let her run my boring meetings, though. The employees looked miserable. They're like, how do you get, like, <laughs> jazzed up for, like, That's, your yes. team meeting? I would like and it was to like, see... Hi, I'm Mika. I never take a day <laughs> off, ever. I've never known what fun is like. I have no emotion. I didn't even zip up my dress this morning. I won't allow so my busy. human emotions to... Dictador is my life. 
and it will take up. over the world. We're going to happy hour. Want to join? No, cannot join. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> have to work. Yeah, at one point she basically <laughs> said something along the lines of, "I'm not bogged down by the the human emotions. I'm able to to be strategic and focus on what's best for the company." And is that a good thing, though? No. And this is going to get so much worse. Like, again, think of where we were 20 years ago. Nothing we is were ever going to be on close. To dial up AOL, yeah. little chat rooms. Like, think was, of how fucking far we It was amazing. I have nostalgic memories. Me too. Of, of I miss it all. Dial up. Go back. And the, the, <laughs> few, the minute or two you have while you get connected mm-hmm. and the anxiety and just the excitement's building up for that, you've got mail. And then you see the number, you're like, yeah. Boom, boom, boom. yeah. And now it's like, open your phone. Oh, 10 new no- notifications in the last them. 10 minutes. Insane. Well, nothing will ever be closed again. What do you mean? So like Christmas Day. Right. The world shuts down. I hate it, this. I love Christmas Day because <laughs> you feel <laughs> like... Time. Well, and it doesn't shut no, down completely. No, Starbucks is still open for your morning. Yeah, a lot of grocery theaters stores. are, Chinese restaurants. Tons of people yeah, have to work. Screw those places. I know, I agree. And like, same with uh, Black Friday. They're like getting that shit going now on Thanksgiving. It's terrible. Employees have to leave their family. Oh, it's so fun. We have, we are so lost. Okay. We have really lost our values. So what if we use AI during those times, like, okay, on Thanksgiving and Black Friday, there's no human employees because they're with their family. Instead, it's all run by robots. But if you still need to go... And get your damn TV for 25% off. You can. Mika will meet you there. Yeah. <laughs> so what, we just lock them up for the rest of the time? I could be down to that. Just power them off. If we only use them in extreme They're like, no, don't turn me off. I don't know. They'll figure out how to turn themselves back on, though. Yeah, that's they'll, the thing. They'll get smarter than you. They'll be like, oh, you know where the off switch is. Okay. I'm going to create an elaborate plan to make sure I can always turn myself yes. back on. Yes. It would be wild one day to, to just be, you know, even in most places too, like two, three, especially if you live in the suburbs, like two, three in the morning is pretty quiet. There's, you know, there's not a lot going on, but, but Mika's up working, but yeah, you, one day, (laughs) if you were to drive out at three in the morning, like every business is open and doing business at all hours of the night because they have these bots that never sleep that just keep on going. Or you you drive you know if you drive past the Denver Tech Center at night you can just see all the empty offices and it's kind of like this I don't know it's kind of a cool little view to see just like everybody went home for the day but then imagine driving past it and there's just like little be like robots <laughs> like running around in there like constantly like it's like a horror movie yeah. I hate it it's it's wild man but apparently there is significant delay with Mika. When she was put in charge, it takes a while for her to process and respond to your questions. So she's not even really fulfilling her end of the bargain here. Or now, she's she's learning. Rapidly she's developing. still learning. Yep. In robot years, she's like a two year old. Yeah, she's <laughs> she's learning up, down, more. So okay, she's smarter than our two year old. True, our two year old's pretty smart though. She's not even she's, two. She's a year or, three months. Okay. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> But how about this? This is something I might employ here at our company. I'd like to be able to read my employees' brainwaves because I want to know every little thought and feeling. This is so fucked. Because, yeah, there's software right now that you can install on computers that is basically like spy. It's spyware, Mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. It's like gets keystrokes, takes screenshots. What employees do sends me beautiful reports. I don't use it, but... I've done some research so on it. So you say. Because I've contemplated it, especially for Janelle. I want to know what you do all day. <laughs> you don't want to know, man. That's why my Mac has a virus. Yeah. I'm on Dictador. <laughs> <laughs> Always on the Dictador. But even with something like that, if you were to install that, you there aren't there ways that people will set it so that their mouse just like moves on its own no, and they I, go to sleep? It can capture. No, that's... That's just to get that only gets you past That's like, like Slack. your Slack or Skype oh, okay. status. But it's like taking screenshots of your screen. So it's see like the mouse and, and to like mm-hmm. to have the mouse mover on is actually a program. So like this software would be able to see that. Oh, he's got mouse mover 2.0 running, moving his mouse. I see. So you could do, be more creative than that. Some people set up like a little fan with a little thing on it and it goes around and around. <laughs> and I know my brother did this at one point and, and it moves the mouse over and over again just slightly kind of bumps it so it just moves it enough that it sends the status back to active <laughs> to be clear not 
when not, he was not working Not while he was us. working for us, no. <laughs> no, at, we don't have anything like that. Past, but. past employers. But this company is called Emotive, and it's created earbuds and headsets that our employees can wear so that we can monitor their brain activity. <laughs> so fucked. One of their devices, the MNA earbuds, looks like any other set of earbuds. However, instead of playing music like many of our employees love to do or being used during a team meeting, the buds are actually monitoring your brain activity and looking for signs of stress, attention, and focus. And these buds send the data straight to us. These are sweet God. earbuds, though. So the reason why an employer might want this is to try and improve our employees' work-life balance, their you know, if they're feeling stressed, then we can be like, hey, you're looking a little stressed today. I it's got your reading this morning. It says you're stressing out majorly. What's going on? Is there anything I can do? But that is so invasive. <laughs> if they want to tell you that they're stressed out, they can come and talk to you. They're capable of expressing that. And I think this is trying to be modeled as something that, oh, it's going to Improve and, productivity and yeah, no, help it's get all tasks about done better. That's what it's really improve about. Improve training. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I it, don't think it's must, mostly to, to help with stress, stress and attention and make sure your employees mm, are yeah. mentally okay. It's to, to help your bottom line. It was saying that to some degree it can even figure out the difference between if you're focused in on something having to do with your job and focused in on something that's not, that has nothing to do with your job, but you're still like online focusing on whatever a sports team or something. It can tell the difference. Yeah, it can like figure oh, that'd out. That'd be awesome. <laughs> that is, oh my God. This inside data would be crucial. <laughs> God. Janelle's spending four hours a day on Dick the Door. <laughs> hey, is everything okay at home, Janelle? Do we need to talk to John? Do we need to bring John in? That's just so insane. So they're they're advertising it as a way to like, this will make your business better because you can ultimately know how to address work-related things with your employees better. Like maybe they come in at eight and they're just stressed to all hell because they just sat in traffic for an hour. And so maybe to lower that stress and make them more productive for the day, you let them come in later. Stuff like that. Which could we just use our natural like, human instincts hey guys, to notice something like that? What time works best for coming in? I know traffic is bad. Yeah. Is it stressful? You're running have late a, all the time. Have a conversation. But no, we have to read their well, brains. Well, yeah, it's easy for us to be like, have, get everybody in a room and have a conversation. But if you have 500 employees, that's not really possible. That's true. So imagine you could just have all this data being brought in by 500 employees. And but you if could, you have 500 employees, then you definitely have room to hire people that are specifically there to check in with people well, and speak to them. This could essentially get rid of the manager. So... Bye, Janelle. Thanks. We don't need you anymore. Oh, my Bye. God. I'm just going to get every, these earbuds for everybody, and I'll Honestly. just sit in my office all day monitoring their brainwaves. <laughs> With the way all this is going, none of us are needed anymore. That's the reality. I'm glad you're, you're, you're seeing the, the end result of all this. You're glad? <laughs> Why yeah. are you glad? Because then I can fulfill my life's mission of moving to the middle of nowhere and being self-sufficient off-grid, where I never have to interface with humans ever again or society and leave okay, it all but behind you say that but you're like a tech you're totally obsessed with tech yeah, yeah i i like Josh lives game in... video games but that's it <laughs> bro you have a new laptop like every month. true true i do love laptops but <laughs> he's always like oh yep returning this one getting yep. another one trying yeah it actually out. this this one's coming up on the return so i gotta get this back i got another one coming so dude i told you no more no i have a Get i have one a system and, oh the return and then you such a pain in the ass to return them. I like to be. I did spend a lot of years in tech. I have a degree in technology. Right. I do like it, but I don't like the artificial intelligence bit of it. That part scares me. But I do like this technology. I think this brainwave technology, this to me is a great way to look inside the human brain as opposed to like Neuralink, where it's like, let's implant a microchip in your brain and then connect it to the computer. At least this is less invasive and it's, you know, it's just monitoring. It's like putting, you know, what what they put on you when you go into, you know, the neurosurgeon or whatever, and they do, you know, run tests on you. It's kind of the same type of thing. I feel like it's just a, a, a different application for it. But this company Emotive does claim that all of its clients sign agreements to not promote, demote, or fire any employees based on their brain data. Mm. Because okay. that would be pretty fucked up. And I'm uh, there probably yeah. is some legality 
issues there. I think there are, are a lot more. Be like, God damn, that. this employee is so stressed out. They're not getting their work done. Yeah. They're out. Yes. They just That's can't how handle it would this. be used. Mm-hmm. It's all. Or bad. it's just like, man, Jimmy's brainwaves are low. <laughs> they're, they're, <laughs> oh my they're, God. There is big lapses in brain activity coming from Jimmy, <laughs> this man. This is just so invasive. This is. We might need to drug test Jimmy. I hate. <laughs> I hate learning about this, honestly. I had no idea that this was going to be a thing. But there Makes is sense. a, but listen to this perspective because this is interesting. So there is a Duke University professor named Nita Farahani that makes a point that this technology could actually be used for certain jobs to make them safer and could potentially save lives. For example, imagine a truck driver getting into an accident because he accidentally fell asleep at the wheel. And if he had been wearing one of the monitoring devices, the company would have been alerted that he was not alert enough to keep driving and would have told him to stop before getting into an accident. What do you think of that application? Because like the brain waves change when you start going into sleep, and so you're there, it's able to detect that. Of course, there are pros. I do. That's interesting. But because that may not be a. I mean, there's a lot of fatal accidents that occur. Of course, of course. And if we can prevent things like that, of course, it's, it's a double edged sword. It's, yes, yeah. it's everything's a double edged sword. I just think that the edge. The bad edge is is a lot sharper. Or we just don't work these truck drivers so much so that they have time right. to sleep. Right. And, not, and humans just need to basic stop being greedy. Human compassion. Well, it's like if we just stopped being greedy, mm-hmm. life would be better for everybody. Let's right. be real. This is just going to push us further and further into the rat race, is how I feel. Oh, yeah. It's just going to amplify it. Yep. There's over 5,000 companies apparently that are already monitoring their employees' brain activity in order to test for levels of fatigue. God, I'm shocked by that. That's truly wild. There's also a company called SmartCap that makes a device known as a life band that's essentially a headband that can be worn or on its own attached to a hard hat that monitors the activity of the brain, specifically fatigue. Here's a video explaining it a little bit more. In the past, learning about fatigue meant learning the hard way. Now, there's a wearable, smarter way to detect fatigue early. Life by SmartCap. A unique monitoring system that helps keep you safe for those who matter the most. Life works by calculating real-time fatigue measurements based on EEG readings and proven algorithms. The thought leaders in fatigue monitoring, getting everyone home safe every day. Dude, this is so black. Isn't that so sweet? No, <laughs> we don't need this. It's called, you know, when you're Stop fucking tired. Your you know, when you're tired. The fact that people don't feel they can express that they're tired and given time to rest is where the problem is. Not giving them a fucking hat to alert. Why? What is different? than this hat feeding you data telling you something about your employees than your employees telling you themselves. It's because they're afraid to. They're afraid they're going to lose their jobs if they don't burn themselves out until they're exhausted and unable to function. Well, and who knows what kind of repercussions come from what if your little, you know, hat goes off and your boss is like, oh, God, yeah. he's tired again? Yeah. Oh, Sorry, your you're... hat's been telling yeah. us way too much. <laughs> yeah. You just must have an issue with your sleep or whatever you're doing outside of work. You're not yeah. sleeping enough. You're not, you know. I don't know. I feel like this application probably doesn't work that well. If I'd imagine like, yeah. it has to be on there pretty tight to be able to like get those readings and stuff. And I imagine how many people want to wear that shit too? Day in, day out, have this like tight headband strapped around your head. Yeah. I, again, I feel like it's treating people 
almost like animals. Like they're not capable of speaking out for themselves, mm. which of course they are, but it's, it's fear of losing their job that keeps them grinding until something horrible happens. I think these things can be eliminated without having to wear f- stupid little hats, but that's just me. Interesting. Well, this Duke University professor also has a perspective that instead of worrying about AI completely taking over the workforce and essentially making humans not needed, that humans and AI can actually work together and AI can actually assist humans in doing their job in a more efficient way. Let's listen to this professor speaking at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. Which I find to actually be quite exciting and something that I think companies should be experimenting with. And that is the use of the technology to make the workplace a more responsive workplace to the individual worker. We've all heard the whole idea that robots are coming for our jobs, that there will be no jobs left for humans. With generative AI, I think we have good reason to wonder how we're going to integrate that in ways that keep us relevant and challenged and important uh, in the workplace. But there's a different pathway forward, which is a responsive workplace. One where humans and robots and AI work seamlessly together in order to optimize a better and healthier workplace. In one experiment, Penn State researchers were able to show that by monitoring brainwave activity with AI in a factory setting, the robot could sense stress levels in the individual and change the speed with which they were giving tasks to the human calibrating it so that rather than suffering from cognitive overload, it would bring it to levels of cognitive load. This idea of cognitive ergonomics is what I think is the future of the healthier workplace, a place that adapts to our abilities, slows down when we need to slow down, and helps us to reset so that we don't suffer from endless cycles of stress. I mean, it sounds That's all great in theory, theory, but let's, let's see this applied. I don't think it will actually be used that way. That's the thing with harm the the worker. There's a lot of lofty goals with AI Mm -hmm. and a lot of promises. And I don't know. Speaking of promises, can we can we talk about Neuralink and Elon? Elon Musk, you either love him or you hate him. I feel like most people (laughs) have turned on Elon. I mean, my God. Especially from where we started with him to now, it's just, uh, he just continues to make things worse and worse, it feels. Mm -hmm. Well, Neuralink, if you're not familiar, is supposedly going to change, change everything. We've talked about Neuralink many times on the Mm -hmm. show, but it's, it's right there. But it's this implanted technology that goes in the brain and it supposedly is going to have the ability to help paralyze people walk again, as well as cure other neurological issues, among other things. And obviously the goal with this is to be able to connect the human brain directly to computers, which will allow humans to control computers with their brain. So imagine not having to use your extremities anymore to control your phones, your computers, your electronic devices, and you could just your brain could just tap into that network and you could do everything via the brain. Sounds like fun. <laughs> mm, I don't know. And recently, Neuralink announced that they're going to be starting human trials and they're looking for its first volunteer. They're saying that the ideal candidate would be a quadriplegic under the age of 40. And there are thousands of people who have expressed interest in getting the surgery, and the trial is estimated to take about six years. And essentially, what would happen is part of the skull would be removed while a <laughs> robot known as R1, inserts 64 threads into the brain. Each thread is extremely thin, only about 1 14th diameter of a strand of human hair, and is lined with 16 electrodes that are programmed to gather data about the brain. These electrodes would then monitor neural activity relating to movement, and that data is decoded by Neuralink computers. R1 has already performed hundreds of experimental surgeries on animals, including pigs, sheep, and monkeys. And obviously, whenever you start experimenting on animals, it's not going not gonna to end well. And in the way that they're doing it is terrible because they're facing a ton of backlash right now. They're under federal investigation for potentially violating animal welfare laws. Internal employees say that because of the pressure from Elon to accelerate 
development as quickly as possible, there have been many botched experiments on animals. These failed tests have resulted in increased numbers of animals being killed from testing. Since 2018, the company has killed roughly 1,500 animals, including pigs, sheep, and monkeys. It's fucking disgusting. So the Guardian dug into this pretty deep, and their quote is saying, five people have worked on Neuralink's animal experiments, told Reuters that they had raised concerns internally. They said they had advocated for a more traditional testing approach in which researchers would test one element at a time in an animal study and draw relevant conclusions before moving on to more animal tests. Instead, these people said Neuralink launches tests in quick succession before fixing issues in earlier tests and drawing complete conclusions. The result means, obviously, more animals are tested and ultimately killed, in part because the approach leads to repeated tests. One former employee who asked management several years ago for more deliberate testing was told by a senior executive it wasn't possible given Musk's demands for speed. Two people told Reuters they had left the company over concerns about animal research. So it doesn't surprise me that Elon's trying to push everything to the max he can, as he does with everything he does before actually thinking through what are some possible consequences of doing it this way. But I don't know. I'm very skeptical about Neuralink. I think it's a lot of talk, and I just I don't know that it'll ever get to the finish line. I think in the idea of it, being able to help those that are paralyzed and have neurological disabilities, mm -hmm. I mean, that would be absolutely incredible of if this course. actually works. Advancement, when it helps humans, is always amazing. When it actually is life-changing for people. But at is, what cost? Too? At what cost, yeah. right? And obviously, it would be fantastic to see people's lives completely changed by something like this and to be able to live much fuller, more rewarding lives. But you know, once Neuralink figures out how to do those good things, either that technology is going to get out to other people who want it for other reasons. You know what I mean? It's like, well, in my mind, that's the real goal and that they can ease it into society and make us all feel better about it if they pitch it as it's going to help. It's going to change lives and people will be able to walk again or, you know, all these different things, but at the core of it, is that really their main goal? Right. Is that right. what Elon wants? No, the main goal is to connect it to computers because then once you have that ability, sky's the limit on what you can do at yeah, that point. Yeah, and I think it's ultimately to control the masses. Yeah, that's a really, really good take, I think. Actually, just a few days ago, on October 30th, President Joe Biden signed a 63-page executive order regulating AI. Way to go, Joe. Joe we did it Biden. <laughs> we did it joe we did it joe <laughs> we did it joe he might benefit from i'm like does joe biden even understand what ai is you think does he have a good understanding of it i mean at this point they might need to get a neural link in like, there but <laughs> i don't know <laughs> joe. damn all right all right i mean he does have a few quotes he says ai is all around us to Amazing. realize <laughs> thank you uh joe how is the best case scenario joe biden to realize the promise of AI and avoid the risk, we need to govern this technology. We need the iron fist come down on this. He had like a speech, but to be honest, I, I didn't watch it. And yeah. I didn't pull from it. <laughs> That's fine with me. <laughs> okay. I'm sure we wouldn't have gathered that much from it anyway. Biden has asked the Department of Homeland Security to help ensure that AI is used safely and securely. But this is where, like, should the government get involved with regulating this? This would also require developers of AI to share their safety test results with the government before they're able to release their product to the public. Does These, that make me feel better? Yeah, no. Does no. the government really give a fuck? No. Yeah. I think it all sounds good. Yeah, you know, of course. Good PR. Yes. This executive order also includes creating ethical standards for the use of AI. It discusses providing guidance to landlords, federal benefit programs, and federal contractors to prevent AI algorithms from worsening discrimination. In addition, due to the increasing amount of concerns regarding how AI will impact the workforce, Biden is asking his administration to create a report on the potential impact of the labor market and to create options to strengthen federal support for workers who face potential labor disruptions due to AI. It'll be interesting to see how the government internally applies AI within all the various departments. Mm -hmm. One that could really use the help, the post office. Yeah. Like, what? Yeah. Like, really need some some love from ai or just love or just but. or just love <laughs> my god can the post office get a renovation at this point i, know, I feel I know, so bad like bad. oh my god i feel bad anybody that works in the post, i feel for you like that mm -hmm. 
That is a it's tough a place mess. to work, man. It's a yeah. mess. It, it has literally not changed in like 150 years. No. It's the same, same thing. Mm -hmm. Except for at the same time, everything has changed. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I get you. So agencies will have between 90 and 365 days to comply with these new order with different deadlines per agency. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. But let's get into a few more positives with AI, specifically relating to crime. Because I thought I, this is one area where I think mm -hmm. AI really, really could help us out. I do agree on this one. Especially when it comes to law enforcement, their ability to investigate, their ability to process data and information and, and evidence. I think AI could really help. So we all know that there are thousands of hours of body cam footage being recorded throughout the country every single day. But did you know, and it probably makes sense once you think about it, that only 1% of that body cam footage is actually ever reviewed, which, you know, it's really been used in a way where if there if a problem arises, then you can review it and it's a way to hold people accountable. But how much could we gain and improve if we were actually reviewing all of that footage? Yeah, it's a great um, point. But we just don't have enough hours in the day, obviously, to review all that footage that is Well, there's captured. like one person per department that in most agencies, I mean, some of the larger agencies, they have more, but it could be like one sergeant that that's like all they do yeah. is review. So review body cam footage. every second of everybody on the team's shift. You can't do it, right? Um, well, there is this platform now called Trulio. And according to their site, Trulio, and this is a quote. They process body cam videos for departments across the country to help automate supervision, uh, facilitate coaching, and promote police professionalism. Trulio detects critical events such as use of force, pursuits, frisking, and non-compliance incidents, and screens for both professional and unprofessional officer language to enable supervisor recognition or review. I love this. This is great. I mean, for the most part, this this one is... um appealing to me because i've always i've always wondered that too i'm like if you think about your your average patrol officers i mean on any given shift you have one supervisor generally sometimes there's more than one depending on on the department but generally it's like a typical graveyard shift you might have one sergeant who is the supervisor for all the other officers and there could be eight ten officers on shift and that supervisor is responsible for all those other officers actions that night yeah, and they're all wearing body can't how insane. on earth is he able to effectively coach and train and continue to train those officers without you any just help can't. you just can't no it's difficult so let's listen to ceo anthony tassoni explain more about how trulio works as well as other forms of ai that are assisting the police force good policing far outweighs the bad so ai is both transcribing the video immediately it separates out the officer from the speaker, which is really unique. That's called speaker diarization. And so in the blue, you can see officer language. And in the gray, you see other language, other people that are at the scene. Aurora, Colorado is among two dozen hey. departments where Trulio is at work. APD is also adding another layer of AI to help nab criminals faster. We're able to almost pursue somebody from the onset of commission of a crime through virtual uh, through, through cyber. And that is going to be huge. Also in the fight, an AI-driven tool that can alert detectives as soon as a crime is reported to dispatch. Through AI, notifies the relevant detective so they can get to the scene and solve the crime and get the evidence and track down the perpetrator almost instantaneously. Law enforcement is relying on more AI-enhanced cameras as well. In North Carolina, highway patrols use tech for ticketing commercial truckers who aren't wearing a seatbelt or have a phone in hand. More city buses are getting AI-equipped, too, in order to target and cite drivers illegally parked in bus lanes. But like other industries, law enforcement is proceeding with caution. As this AI continues to evolve, yeah, I think Part of the conversation has to be how far do we take it and what are the possibilities of AI becoming self-aware. Next thing you know, AI robotics join up and they really decide they don't need us, right? <laughs> Even he's worried. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I love mean, this for law enforcement, though. I do, too. It's really interesting. And what's fascinating about it is it was invented after the murder of George Floyd in 2020, and the whole goal 
of Trulio is to detect bad police work and allow officers to have time to correct their behavior long before it gets to the point where there is an event that becomes deadly, such as the murder of George Floyd. Um, so it will be used to detect good police work and use that for examples in training as well as promotion. So yeah, rewarding great. people who are making that's what they really need because really I feel improve. like there's a lot of time officers feel like nobody's you know nobody's looking over their shoulder. Mm-hmm. Nobody's reviewing their work. I mean it's a hard it's like one of those jobs where it's a lot of trust is put into the officers and in, mm-hmm. in their daily duties. And so this this system is able to go through and flag all of those things that happen during their shift and then provide a, a neat report to their supervisor that they can easily go and review and be like, oh, this is when this happened. This is when that yeah. happened. See how it kind of created chapters within it and brought and, things to the surface that he may not have known about otherwise. Yeah. I mean, at this point, Trulio is able to detect 5 million key terms such as noncompliance, profanity, and professional language. Trulio scans all the body cam footage and then is able to detect specific moments in that footage that need to be further reviewed by a human at that point. And in California, the Alameda Police Department has been using Trulio for about a year at this point. Um, The department claimed that they've seen a 36% drop in the use of force by an officer. Wow. I mean, that's huge. So things like that start to sell me on AI, right? But And this is this is this is a very different type of AI from the yes. one that we've been talking about. Right. This right. this type of AI, more of the AGI is is, you know, or using it through software application to me to to process large amounts of data makes a lot of sense mm-hmm. and speed up communication channels and just overall make efficiency and productivity go up. I I like AI applications for that because I think there's huge holes that we continue to fail with as humans especially when it comes to to law enforcement and there's so few of them and so much data and crime to deal with that they don't possibly have the ability to efficiently work through all of that mm. and as we've seen firsthand i mean i feel like most departments could benefit from this type of technology so if we could keep ai to just things like this right i'd be more on board and obviously, we've talked a lot about how it could help change people's lives who have, who are paralyzed or have diseases that really limit their quality of life. So Keith Thomas, he's a 45-year-old man um, from Long Island, New York, and he was paralyzed after accidentally diving into the wrong side of a pool back in July of 2020. And he ended up breaking his neck at the C4 and C5 vertebrae of his spine. He was left paralyzed from the neck down, completely unable to move or feel his limbs as just absolutely horrific. So this was until he was able to participate in a clinical trial to be the first patient to receive something called a double neural bypass, which is a new biotechnical therapy out of Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research in New York. This is an experimental procedure that involves a combination of brain computer interface implants external computers and guess what you guessed it artificial intelligence a neural bypass basically uses both machine learning and electrical signaling to essentially reroute someone's neural signals this basically avoids whatever quote unquote block is preventing the signals from going where they're supposed to and creating a new route for them to travel this is somewhat similar to our coronary bypass surgery when we create a detour that allows your heart to pump blood around the roadblock This surgery is used something called thought-driven therapy, which basically means a chip is embedded in the patient's brain and uses machine learning to interpret various patterns and neurons. This surgery was successful and brought back movement and sensation to Keith's arms and hands. Now that is absolutely incredible. And it's things like this that push me in the direction of, okay, maybe I'm being too cynical. Maybe I'm resistant i am just resistant to change in general in general well i think we are inherently as humans resistant right. to change right but, and maybe but it's easy for us to say especially if we don't you know we're we don't have anything wrong or, you know what i mean if, if you have one of these things going on like yeah if there's a way to make your quality of life better we're oh, all gonna seek that it out if i so. were in his position for sure so let's take a look at a, a few clips here that explains why this surgery was successful It was the next day, it was July 18th, 2020, and we were just hanging up by the pool, and I went to dive into the pool. So, like, I dove in, 
aggressively as usual. And then I just blacked out. Next thing you know, there was a helicopter on the front lawn. And, you know, the next day, the next day I couldn't even move. He was paralyzed from the chest down. And then October 2021, I met Chad. And they approached me about joining the study. When we met Keith for the first time, he was not even able to lift his arms uh, off of his wheelchair, and he was not able to feel anything in his arm and hands either. After Keith was enrolled into the study, we performed functional MRI, and this allowed us to uh, view the motor and sensor areas of Keith's brain, uh, and it allowed us to really pinpoint where we needed to implant both the motor and sensory electrodes. <laughs> After opening the skull and opening the cover of the brain, we then got out a stimulator. We had a pretty good idea where the hand areas were going to be, and we stimulated them directly. You feel the thumb? It's in the thumb? Yeah, you feel the thumb. So I placed it right over one area, and he said, I feel my thumb. I said, what part of your thumb? He said, my thumb tip, the inside of my thumb tip. And I said, oh, we found it. At that point, we brought in the actual device, mounted it onto the skull, and then used these wires to gently lay them without damaging them, and place them precisely in those three areas that felt the fingers, as well as the two areas where we knew that his hand motor function was. So Keith's brain is literally connected to a computer. There are signals from his motor area responsible for movement going to the computer, and signals from the computer are going back to different stimulation points in his body, brain, and spinal cord. And the goal is to restore movement and the sense of touch in a lasting way. First time in three years he feels his sister's well, hand. Like to see an actual person, like a family member, touch you and feel that oh, is different. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Since Keith has started the trial, he has gained over 100% in arm strength. Wow. And he's already starting to feel sensations in certain parts of his arm and even wrist. We have started to see some lasting new sensations in his arm that are present even when we turn off the bypass. Wow. Amazing. For me personally, this is an incredible moment. For years, we have been wanting to really tackle the restoration of movement and the sense of touch and bring those together. And we've also wanted to create lasting effects. I think we're gonna continue to see progress and I think it'll be applicable to uh, the millions of folks around the world that, that really need this technology. The early 2000s, researchers have restored limb mobility to people paralyzed after accidents or strokes using techniques like brain-computer interfaces, neural bypass, spinal cord stimulation, and robotic limbs or exoskeletons. But what makes Thomas's double neural bypass a groundbreaking feat is that it connects the brain, spine, and body to restore both movement and the sense of touch, even when he is not attached to external systems. I feel it on the wrist. Which we have started to see some lasting new sensations in his arm that are present even when we turn off the bypass. This is very, very encouraging, and we'll be looking uh, very closely at this as the trial continues. A surgeon implanted five electrode arrays in regions of Thomas's brain that control movement and feeling. The arrays decode and transmit his brain activity to an amplifier on his skull. Those signals are then sent to a computer, which sends another message to electrodes placed on his skin, stimulating the muscles he needs to move. Keith, can you hear me? Okay, Keith, I'll let you tell, tell anything in your... That is incredible technology. And it is. Can't wait to see where that goes. And that's a... That's a positive application mm -hmm. of artificial intelligence and just technology in general. So many lives will be changed by things like that in, in such massive ways. Um, another thing we wanted to get into is AI helping with PTSD dreams. Now, this is pretty interesting stuff as well. Have you ever been dreaming and then realized that you were dreaming? Have you ever experienced this? Nope. Really? Which is why I love this device. I am so shocked. 
You've never experienced that? No. Neither have I. I have vivid, vivid dreams, but not lucid dreams. So you never realize that you're asleep? That it's a dream that never... Because I don't know if I'm lucid dreaming, but I, I definitely have dreams where all of a sudden I'm but like, usually okay, with well, lucid it's, dreaming it's just you can a dream. control the dream i can't you control right it. right you might be able to be like oh i might be dreaming but like it's the control part of it that truly makes it mm -hmm. lucid dreaming okay yeah yeah so i don't i don't think i'm actually lucid dreaming i feel like i could though if i were to like practice or there's mm -hmm. definitely methods and ways to do it i don't know entirely how effective those methods are some people will claim they're very effective i've tried some of them and they don't don't work for me for some reason. Maybe I'm just a, a deep sleeper or whatnot. But if there is a device that can help me achieve this whenever I want, I am all for it. This device is from a company called Prophetic, and it's working on a device called the Halo with the goal of being released in 2025. So Halo is a neural device that someone wears that would essentially detect when people are in REM sleep and then be able to induce lucid dreaming. How cool is that? Halo would target prefrontal cortex, which is an area of the brain associated with lucid dreaming, and Prophetic would utilize a technology called transcranial focused ultrasound, which is a technique that uses non-invasive ultrasound pulses that interact with neural activity in the brain. Prophetic's chief technology officer, Wesley Lewis Berry III, states that there could be many benefits of being able to induce lucid dreaming, including, quote, everything from helping PTSD, reducing anxiety, improving mood, Confidence, motor skills, and creativity. The benefits are really outstanding. There are some studies that support the idea that lucid dreaming can help with nightmares related to PTSD and reduce feelings of anxiety and depression. No, I mean, really if cool. this device really works, this could be revolutionary because I think one of those things most of us struggle with. And I mean, for me, I just want a lucid dream for the sheer fun of it. Yeah, well, that's like a lot of the reason why they're creating that is just for just recreational. For fun. Yeah. Yeah. Which, speaking of which, you know your boy has secured his Halo. Shut $100. up. Hundred dollars. Reserve your Halo right now. A hundred dollars to reserve to deposit it. it. I don't know how much it'll ultimately be. They haven't oh released God. a price on it. You but already did that. Yes, I have Shut the receipt up. for it. I want this because I need all the experiences in life, as you know. See, this still freaks me out, though. I, I love the idea of it helping people and having all these positive things, but I just—it's so far from what's natural. I don't know if we're supposed to have these things. I struggle so but much with But you naturally it. do can have these things. So why not? If I can't naturally do it on my own, why can't I use this device to I feel like with the it right me? coaching and work that you could do. I ain't got time own. for that. I just want to pop on my headband and go start <laughs> flying around space. Okay. Like that's what I want to do. And if this allows me to do that, hell, I'll pay whatever. Yeah. So right now. The least of my concerns with AI. They still have whatever. reservations. If you're interested, 100 Dollars. The first thousand Sponsored deposits by... get their prophetic app subscriptions <laughs> free for a year. So join me <laughs> in our lucid dreaming journey together. And use code Mile Higher. <laughs> yeah. No, don't. There is no code. <laughs> this is not sponsored by Prophetic. Although Prophetic, if you do want to sponsor your boy, um, send us a free one. I will we'll be your. I will be your your test subject because mm -hmm. lucid dreaming sounds incredible. Dude, I don't want to be a test subject for any of this though. It is freaky. The fact that um, Elon's already looking for candidates to to sign up for Neuralink. Elon, that's, Elon, ugh, Elon is trying trying to do everything, but not very well. Yeah, like his mm. car company's kind of failing. SpaceX is not really doing much. I don't see. You remember all of the talk Spread of him it. going to Mars and this? I'm like, that ain't gonna happen. Like, he's well, and now he's like fully seen. consumed by X and yeah, oh, that's all. He's so trying funny. to dig a tunnel in LA. Like the dude is just all over the place now. It's crazy though. A lot of people. I mean, if would you ever consider getting something like Neuralink? I guess I don't even have to ask you. I know you probably would, huh? If it wasn't permanent, if it's permanent though, I don't know if I'd want like something permanently implanted. Because think it would never stop. It would depend on what I could do with it because one facet of Neuralink that really interests me is the ability to download your, like if we had the ability to access our memory bank and somehow download those and decode them into some sort of visual form that you could like watch back your memories of your whole life. But are you supposed life, to do that? I just No, like you that, only do that when you die. cool. That only happens when you die. You watch your life back. How do you know that really happened? <laughs> Josh has confirmed. <laughs> 
<laughs> I have almost. I like died. to think. Okay. I like to believe that, and In I've my heard dreams, theories but... about that. That you no, get but, to like see it all, and yeah, all flashes well, before your eyes. But are you supposed to just be able to pull that up on a Tuesday night? But wouldn't that be fun? No, like I'm still, I have couch. a lot of like, bad traumatic boop, 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 memories that I don't need to. Well, access. yeah, you can you can keep those locked away. But <laughs> fast forward, <laughs> no, they're in folders. You want to feel happy tonight, or do you want to reminisce and feel sad? <laughs> like, of course, the it's idea like your own of... personal Netflix. <laughs> your all your and then you can your... rate it. Of yeah, course, up down. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Do you recommend this? No. <laughs> Of course, the idea of being able to bring up some of my old memories with, you know, from my childhood or with my grandmother, like sounds so nice to me, but I, it doesn't feel natural. And I don't think you're supposed to do that. I don't think that's part of the, the human experience and what was intended for as we know it in the past, though. I guess. But does the future human experience? And maybe all look this different? is part of the human experience. Well, think I'm about your so grandmother and, and by the time, you know, they got to their elder years, like, they were looking around like, what's going on? I don't, I can't even keep track of what's going on. And maybe they on. were right. Like, the fuck is this? I know my grandma was like. Or it's just all perspective. It's like, that was their perspective. This is our perspective. I think perspective. everything's relative. Our kids are going to be like, ah, mom and dad are old and lame. They don't want to probably hook their brain up to the computer. Probably. I don't know. It all just freaks me out. All I, I know. I was listening to, um, God, it was an interview with Mr. Beast. And he was saying he's, he's like, going, wants to get Neuralink. I'm not surprised by that at all. Well, he, Way he's smarter a, and make more money. He's a trailblazer, he so of course he does. I mean, all the power to him. He was talking about how nice it would be if you if you wanted to cook something for yourself and you don't even have to Google a recipe. You just all of a sudden know you it. know it. Yeah. yeah. But should we know everything? But that takes the learning out of it. Then there's no point in learning anything. And you there's no difference the in intelligence between people. I don't just, know. I hate all just of bots, it. I really bruh. do. Ugh. I think I would get it like decades from now after a lot of other people have it and it's become more. Yeah, that, like, you say that now until. Yeah, I mean, who really knows? But until you get locked away in a room. You would do it of, after enough I don't know. trials. I guess like after it becomes more regulated and normalized mm. because then it's like how you, I feel like it's going to get to the point where you don't really have a choice but together because it's either like you get with the program or you're going to be left behind and you can't do you know, 90% of what the world is is doing at that time. No, that's true. You know? I just don't like it. I don't like it. Well, then let me fulfill my dreams of my off-grid living, and we can live together in peace from all this technology. We can go back as far in time as you want. You want to go back to the 1800s, baby? No we more go back TikTok. back to the 1800s. I will burn your phone. I will bury it, actually. And you will never see the internet again. It'd probably be so good for me, honestly. And we can just garden and raise animals and <laughs> oh, that sounds have amazing. babies. And that sounds amazing. And I can attempt to build shit with tools and <laughs> you throw you away hammers. Shit? You know, <laughs> attempt to to catch our dinner. Like it'd be so much fun. It would be fun. Let's do it. All right, show's ending. All right, that's it. <laughs> it's been a good Career. run. Okay, can you at least get a fucking AI CEO? Because I yep. do not want to live that life. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work here still. So. <laughs> I'm calling up Hanson Robotics tomorrow to get a Mika, Mika 2.0. Well, bring her in. I want to hear all of your thoughts on this. Do you think overall AI is more of a good thing or more of a bad thing? What are your concerns and what are you looking forward to? What level of AI are you willing to accept? Is what I'm curious. But the truth is, it doesn't matter what you're willing to accept. You will be given. It will be forced what upon you no matter yep. what. Mm -hmm. And God, I sound so cynical. Yeah, my God. Like, sorry, it, I'm I'm scared. I'm scared. But about maybe we can defeat right this AI if we all just band together, stop treating each other like shit, start loving one another. Yeah, maybe like we wouldn't we need little hats do. if we actually just talk to each other about how we're feeling. And I'm feeling really tired. Can I go home? Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Otherwise, you can clock out in 15 minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is going to be it for us today. I think we need to do another episode just on Neuralink at some point because there's so much to dive into. Well, and especially it's, it's, once people start getting it, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's developing fast. In a few months, there's going to be much more to talk about, I think. I, I do really I just enjoy hate, the conversation I hate giving AI as much Elon more me. publicity. He wants everybody to talk about his shit. Yeah, know? true. But. Just like, eh. there's so much cooler people out there doing cooler stuff too. I know. 
But futurism, I ta- I just we can talk, talk about futurism. Yeah. Futurism is yeah. a very interesting topic. I do enjoy these topics as much as it scares the shit out of me. But I think we could also focus on a lot more of like, I've even thought about doing an episode of just what does our everyday life look like a more realistic look at the future of like, what does life look like in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years when it comes to like our everyday routines, Mm -hmm. something that's more relatable where it's like, I don't have to do laundry anymore. Amazing. Does it for me? Stuff like that. Those things are appealing. I won't lie. Laundry sucks. Or driving. We may not be driving. It'll just be, we'll be driven Oh, that's like our, my dream in life. We can so ki- just, actually kick oh, back. We don't have yes. to like monitor the wheel. Like we can just actually well, people kick back. do that. That's already that's here. No, you're not supposed to fucking do that. You're not supposed Elon, to like sleep during. Yeah, the car. I want to be able to like take a full ass. No, nap. it's right. Well, if okay, it's legally, so what about the situation? I've seen videos of not, people getting is, Ubers yeah. that are well, driven by nobody. Only in like certain places. That's like a very how tiny is that illegal? Testing. The fuck is that? Yeah, it's there is not much of that going on because there's been some major accidents and fatalities due but to but then that, that like opens the door of people a whole new form of terrorism like you yeah. could literally put well, an attack yeah. on a whole company that has self-driving cars and cause the mass destruction well anyway, it's like cyber, cyber great cyber great point to end this Sorry. show on today. <laughs> thank you for that we're like trying to think about the no, pauses if you no, it could be hacked and destroyed <laughs> and blow you hey. up well i agree i think the the cons far outweigh the pros when it comes to AI in general. And we should all be fucking scared, in my opinion. But I want to do more on this. All right. I got plenty more where this this came from. So okay, there's lots more to talk about the future. Well, we want to hear from you guys. Let us know. And to all of you out there, I know we started this um, expressing our feelings about everything. But we just want you to know that we love and appreciate you. Those of you out there who are so kind as the majority of you. Um, support us and have such interesting things to add to our conversations and we we really enjoy reading your comments and your feedback and it's always a, a highlight of our week that is going to be it for us today we will be back next week of course but until then keep taking your mind a mile higher